We're in a lovely house where lovely people line up at the door and check that they look lovely. You see, they want to make sure that the lovely house patriarch, who turns out to be the doctor, has a lovely start to his day. Everybody's lovely to him and he departs, transferring to sick bay from the holodeck. When asked by Kez how his new holo family's turning out, we discover that the doctor thinks they're lovely, despite the fact that they're about as realistic as a politician's promise. Up on the bridge, we're flying towards a space station run by some new friends, or, more accurately, bits of it. It appears someone done a kaboom to it, and only an hour before we arrived. Janeway thinks this is a bit unreasonable, so we're going to find out who done it. Handily, there seems to be some sort of energy wibbly leading away from it, so we're off to follow the breadcrumbs. While we do, Balana's taking the opportunity to run some maintenance on the Doctor, rather nicely referencing that she thought it would be wise given all the tinkering he's been doing on himself. Seems like a good time to mention he's made a holler family, explaining that he believes this will give him an insight into why his patients seem so preoccupied with their own. He even invites Balana and Kez over to have dinner with them. In the lovely house, the lovely wife serves lovely food, and lovely children express their admiration for a lovely father. Wife thinks he's lovely too, obviously, though she refers to him as Kenneth, and I'm glad to see the plot element of his name has been swiftly and satisfyingly concluded. As his lovely children explain why their father is so wonderful, Balana finally snaps and calls bullshit. She tells him that what he has here is not a family, but a fantasy, referring to them as lollipops, and you know what? That's a pretty good descriptor. Overly saccharine and with no discernible substance to speak of. She offers to lend a hand, bringing a little realism to the situation, if he's interested. Back on the bridge, we've reached the end of the breadcrumb trail. Slight problem, there's nobody here. Slightly bigger problem, there's some sort of subspace mega-swirly. Even more slightly bigger problem, our engine's just conked out. Janeway gets ready to poop some yellow at it, but it stops before they get a chance. We've taken a little damage to the hull and a starboard shield got a bit weakened, but we're otherwise fine. As an aside, Voyager was facing this anomaly head-on and the debris was moving left to right on the viewscreen, so impacts would have been on the port side of the ship, not starboard. Anywho, our engines are back online now, so we can return to that destroyed space station and gather the dead, our act of kindness helping to lessen the pain felt by grieving loved ones. I mean, we could do that, but pff, fuck em. Janeway's found a shiny new anomaly, so we're going to check that out instead. Time for the Doc to meet his new, somewhat more realistic, family. He's greeted by what I presume is supposed to be a cacophony of noise, but actually sounds like a bit of a banger. His wife rushes to leave as she has a speech to give, much to the doc's consternation. A panicked daughter is looking for a mallet for her sports practice, stopping mid-search to comment on the noise. The tune in question is Klingon, and we learn Doc's son has been playing it all day, at volume. Perhaps it's a summoning ritual of some kind, as two Klingon youths turn up at the door. Son invites them in as daughter screams that Mum would help her find her sports mallet, because Mum isn't a worthless, selfish bastard. Welcome to family life, Doc. In the mess hall, Paris is hitting on Balana. After grabbing a tablet from her against her will because Tom Paris is a dick, we learn it's the Klingon equivalent of a Mills and Boone novel. A bit of bad flirting is mercifully interrupted by the return of the Mega Swirly, and we all run to the bridge. Once there, Paris takes over from the guy who was already flying the ship, which feels a bit rude to me, but I guess they can't have a separate show for each shift. We fart a probe into the Mega Swirly, which tells us it's weird inside. Mega Swirly thinks this is bang out of order and disappears, taking the probe with it. Curiously, the probe is still transmitting, apparently now inhabiting a layer between space and subspace, so I'm going to call it Dom Space. We'll have to come back to that, though, as Janeway's plan all along was to try and harvest some energy from the Mega Swirly, so she could have infinite replicated coffee. The Mega Swirly's gone, but it left a wake we might be able to scoop up and use for energy. Voyager can't do it because science reasons, so Paris offers to go out in a shuttle. There's a pretty good chance it'll irradiate the shit out of him, but he's already been turned into a lizard before, so that's nothing. We'll visit the dock before we set off and see if he has a cream for the radiation. The protection turns out to be a spray, but that's fine, because we're only here to discuss his family anyway. 
Whilst admitting there are a handful, the doc now believes he has a solution to his problem. Paris points out that his method of approaching this is flawed, that he's seeing his family as something to be cured rather than accommodated, which is an oddly incisive comment for such an ass. but we'll let him have this win. At home, the doctor is laying down the law, and by the law I mean a list of rules the others must obey in order to make him happy. As well as entirely rescheduling the lives of wife and daughter, these rules also seem to include a bit of the old racism, The son is no longer allowed to socialise with Klingons. I wonder if this includes inviting Balana to dinner. This all goes down about as well as you'd expect, and wife points out that he's being an unreasonable, dictatorial twat. She and son both leave after essentially telling him to cram it, leaving daughter the job of comforting him. She wants to know why she has to change her sports schedule, and we learn that she's playing with kids older than herself because she's rather a prodigy. Thing is, he says that can be dangerous, and I suppose the fact that you play the game with a fucking hammer is rather a clue. As an olive branch, daughter agrees to the change if it'll help, and we're left with the doc finding some comfort in that connection. Comfort is precisely what Paris doesn't have as he flies a shuttle through the Megaswirly's wake. It's working, though, so Janeway's willing to sacrifice him for that delicious coffee. We might end up with neither, as another Megaswirly opens up and Paris is pulled towards it, which feels a bit odd when everything else is being pushed away from it, but let's ignore that for now. We lose contact and the Megaswirly disappears, as does Paris. Looks like he's been pulled into Dom space, which, if it follows nominative determinism, is probably his idea of Stovacor. We manage to have a chat with him by doing a science, and he says he's fine, though his face suggests the blatant false advertising of Dom space isn't going to do it for him. Unless his kink is disappointment. Which, now that I think about it, would explain a lot of his actions. Down in Segbay, the doc's struggling to focus on his work. Kez takes over and suggests he should spend time with his family, so he gives himself the afternoon off. Which comes as rather a surprise to Sun, as he's here with those Klingon mates he was warned against, the ones who gave him that banger of a mixtape. Oh, and they've brought a stabby toy with them this time too. After lying to him and saying it's a duck tag, which I'm 80% embarrassed and 20% proud to know that it wasn't, we learn that it's a dagger of cutlutch, which is used in bloodletting rituals. Doc's less than impressed by the whole playing with knives thing, a fact probably not helped by the lie. He throws the Klingons out, causing Sun to say he has no right to judge the cultures of others. Whilst it's a fair point, I'd have probably chosen to make it during a ritual that doesn't involve stabbing someone. No matter, as Sun's had enough of his dad's shit and is going to move out. At least things can't get any worse. Oh, by the way, his daughter's had an accident playing hammer sports and is in hospital. Doc's at daughter's bedside when wife arrives. He says he and another doctor operated on her for three hours, and I'm pretty sure operating on family members is a professional ethics issue, but let's ignore that for now. The bottom line is that he can't do anything to save her. Wife takes this badly and seeks a second opinion, which has got to be pretty hard to hear when you literally exist to do medicine. Daughter wakes up and asks when she's going to get better. It's all too much for Doc, who ends the program. Back in sick bay, Kez asks how things are going. He says everything's fine before mentioning that he's decided not to use the program anymore. It was a pleasant enough experience, he says, but he's learned everything he needed to get an understanding of how families affect patients, and that was the point after all. Kez isn't buying it, but knows when not to push. Time to try and get Paris out of Dom space. In the absence of an actual smart plan, he's just going to fly into the middle of a new mega swirly when it looks ready to pop. Okay, the first one put a dent in the hull of Voyager, but we've learned from previous episodes that shuttles are only in real danger when trying to land, so this should be perfectly fine. The new Mega Swirly pops through and Voyager sits right in the path of the planar shockwave because for some reason we still haven't figured out what up and down are. The shuttle does a mini kaboom and Paris is thrown out of his seat, sadly surviving. He gets back up as Voyager decides he's not worth it and turns around. Janeway asks Kim to try and teleport Paris out, just for plausible deniability on his death certificate, only for Kim to teleport the entire bloody shuttle aboard. Talk about overachieving. We stick Paris in sick bay, where the doc is less than understanding, essentially calling him a hot-headed ball bag whose recklessness harms those around him. He's projecting, of course, and yes, that's a hologram pun, but Paris sees something's wrong. The doc tells him about daughter, and they have a discussion on the nature of loss. 
Paris manages to convince him that leaving things as they are will rob him of both the insight he originally sought and the chance for closure. The Doctor returns to the holodeck and completes the program as we fly away. It's understandable that the Doctor would default to what is, in essence, a childishly egocentric interpretation of being a father. He is, after all, only three years old if we take his age to be the sum of his accumulated experience. We could probably have a discussion over how those assumed gender roles should be obsolete by the 24th century, but the show was still written by people in the 20th, so we have to take those internalised biases into account. Whilst it suffers from the same problem as other Voyager plot elements, namely something not being introduced for long enough that its removal carries impact, it does still give Robert Picardo a chance to show off his skills, and us another view of the Doctor as something more than a simple automaton. Before we wrap up, there's one other matter I should address. My earlier comment about it being unexpected that Paris was the one to tell the Doc he was making a mistake in how he approaches his family. I generally come back and write these thoughts after giving it time to percolate through my brain, and I see now that conclusion was wrong. If there's one person on the ship who can fully understand the damage that a dysfunctional family can do, it's Paris. We touched previously on how his flaws can be attributed to his upbringing, so him being the one to see this perpetuated by the Doc makes perfect sense. I don't know whether that was intentional or accidental, but we'll give a point to the writers anyway. End of episode. Hello, I'm the space dog from that episode where Paris got accused of murder. I'm actually supposed to be bald, but I've got a bad skin condition. Anyway, if you like this episode, you could go to patreon.com slash USS Pedant and give him a couple of quid. <laughs> oh, don't. I'm not your mum. I'm a space dog. That'd be weird. Stop being weird. Weirdo. Woof. <laughs>